This is the Brisbane Lions Fancast with Dom Fay and Michael Whiting. Yes, unfortunately, another loss to Richmond continuing their good run against us on the weekend, Mike. It was, uh, look, it was disappointing but not disheartening. No, nah, there was plenty of promise there, Dom. We've seen that a bit this year. I think the fact that the team fought out four quarters, I know it's an effort and it's not something that you know, fans <laughs> always want to hear. They want to see wins, but... I think that was encouraging. That hasn't been something that's been there the entire season. So just, again, probably the polish going inside 50, some poor disposal, poor options and poor execution, which let the team down. But effort-wise was really encouraging. Obviously down on a little bit of quality cattle at the moment, but not a bad performance, I think. Although I know um, you weren't too happy yourself, mate, having to sit through <laughs> it down at the MCG. <laughs> yeah, no, not stoked. It was a, another one. My best mate is a Richmond fan, and he is insufferable. I, I couldn't take another one. I had to bear through it, though. Uh, but I did enjoy reminding him at the end of the night that with their uh, age profile on their list who played, really they should have beaten us by much more. So happy to be a Lions fan right now. Uh, I have to ask though, have you sat through a more frustrating 10 minutes of footy than the first 10 of that last quarter? Oh, well, I was actually down at Metricon Stadium getting ready for the Suns match right. to cover that night, but I was watching it on the TV. I was fixed to the to the last three quarters of the, the match once I'd got down there on the TV and... Oh, it was terribly frustrating. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was pulling my hair out at missed targets and missed opportunities, and I can only imagine what Justin Lepich felt like. But it's sort of been a little bit of a tale of the season in, in some regards, but effort but no execution. So, yeah, it was terribly frustrating. Though. They couldn't quite get within a kick or two to put some genuine pressure on Richmond. Sort of got to that 15, 20 point. Um, margin a few times, but couldn't really put the clamps on, could they? Absolutely not. It was uh, quite disappointing when Buick finally got his goal, though, in the in the last quarter. It was a bit of a, well, rather than celebration, more relief, more like <laughs> finally, because I think at one stage we had 10 inside 50s in a row uh, and we were just struggling to score. It would go in, it would come straight back out. And that hasn't really been a trend this year. I mean, we've struggled to get the ball forward, but when it's gotten down there, we've more or less we've done okay a lot of the time. But towards the end of that game, um, well, I suppose you're starting to see the real loss of Brown now in terms of, uh, you know, structure up forward. We just couldn't get near it. You were sort of hoping for the damn wall to break, but it never quite happened, did it? They needed mm. a couple of goals. But I guess like you, you touched on Jonathan Brown there. That's something we'll probably be scratching our heads about, you know, maybe even this time next year. We don't know how that's going to play out just yet with, with Dan Merritt probably holding the fort there from a senior perspective for the foreseeable future and, uh, the Michael Close. Um, I mean, he played very well the week before, but he was a, probably a little bit down on that form on the weekend. We might just see that for a while, a little bit of inconsistency, particularly from big guys. We know that they take a while and they're going to be up and down. So I guess they get another chance this weekend playing against a team in West Coast that probably gives them a bit of an opportunity for, for another win, I would think. With a young key forward like Michael Close, I don't really ever look for consistency, at least not at this early stage. I'm more interested in glimpses. You, you want to see glimpses that they look like a, a you know a genuine key forward. And Close did, he did take one grab earlier in the game that was called back uh, because Adcock, I believe that the free wasn't paid advantage or the mark wasn't paid advantage. I'm not sure what happened there. But then his mark and goal was um, as composed as you'll see. Now, he didn't do much in the game outside of, of that moment, but it was a glimpse into what he could be as a player. And I have to say, I'm getting more and more optimistic with Close by the week. Yeah, it's a good point. You're, you're right. That's what you're looking for, I guess, to see something that we might see more of in the future. And I think we saw that the previous week against North Melbourne, I think Close had eight marks and maybe three or four of them were contested from memory. So we saw a little bit then. He kicked the goal in that match as well. So you're right. I think the the best stuff we've seen from him has been pretty good. And you, you can see that in... Uh, two years or three years that that might be even better and I hate to keep harking back to Gold Coast but it's a team I see every second week very close up and we saw that with their forwards with Tom Lynch, Sam Day and Charlie Dixon people were questioning them in their first two years when are these guys going to do something and we just kept being told wait 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 when they get four or five years under their belt we'll see it and now we're starting to see that from those guys and I think you'll see the same with Michael Close or John O'Freeman when he gets a chance or even Jackson Payne who's only been in the system three years so just got to hold on a bit, but your your point's exactly right. The glimpses are pretty good. There was an interesting comment that Mark Robinson made in the Herald Sun uh, on Monday. Uh, I, I only read it briefly, but it was something along the lines of with the right forward line, Brisbane could have won this game, in which he was completely right about. Uh, and he raised the prospect. He said, you know, obviously we'll, we'll go for one, you'd imagine, very high in the draft this year. Our first pick, you would almost have to put all money you have on it being a key forward at this stage. 
unless something drastic changes in that regard. But he said also to be we should be looking for mature key forwards either at other clubs or in state competitions, uh, just because you know maybe with a bunch of our players in terms of their age profile, we don't have time to really wait three, four, five years for a key forward to stand up and be in the wilderness until then, which I suppose is why the questioning of, of Leper post-game about is Daniel Merritt someone who can fill that role for a number of years now uh, came up. Now, do you think Merritt can do that, or do you think we should be looking for a more mature one maybe in the state leagues or, or, or at other clubs? Well, I think you should be. I mean, I think the club has looked for them in the past couple of years. Maybe the the bigger names like the Tippets or et cetera, et cetera. There's, the Lions have looked for quite a number of forwards State league competitions, possibly. I mean, it depends. I mean, maybe a genuine forward, I suppose. Dan Merritt, we know he was a forward as a junior, although he didn't start the game until late. But primarily, he's a defender who's playing forward. He's, he's doing a great job. He creates a contest. He's not a natural forward, I don't think. But he's doing a job. And I think it is something he can hold up uh, for a year or two. If you can somehow poach, whether that's by trading or by free agency, or there's no free agents left at the moment. But if you can somehow get a free agent or a trade happening of course it's an area you have to look for people don't want to sit here for five years and hear that you know that we've got to take time for these guys to develop all our forwards the first second and third year that might be a reality though but of course you're going to be on the lookout it would have to be a very good state league forward i think to chase though yeah because yeah. if you're going to get someone in that's 25 or 26 that's played in state leagues they're going to have to be very very good James, like a James Podsy Adley, I suppose, is the best example from Geelong a couple of years ago to come in at that age and make an impact at AFL level. I had a kid doing pretty well in the Tasmanian leagues called Aaron Cornelius. <laughs> 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 uh, but yes, no, I, I know what you mean. It's uh, something where I, I know one who was spoken about last year was Mitch Thorpe, mm. um, who was an ex top 10 pick by Hawthorne and was going pretty well, also down in, in Tasmania, coincidentally. Uh, and, and there was talk he might be picked up, but it's just such a difference, especially in, in body it's size, huge. but in a number of areas, you know, from the state leagues to the top level. I mean, a bunch of probably state league key forwards do get by just on being bigger and stronger, whereas in the AFL, that's not enough. Uh, and so really, you probably slim pickings in those state leagues. Oh, I think so. And clubs generally like to back themselves, particularly Brisbane now. They've picked a number of uh, younger key forwards in the past few years. You tend to try and back yourself and uh, hope that one of those develop. And as for the first pick in the coming draft it probably will be a key forward. It sounds like there's a number of good key forwards. So if the best player available or if you're within one or two picks of the best player available being a key forward, that's certainly an area you have to go for. Absolutely. That's something that will be a talking point for a long time to come, I would imagine. Uh, something else we should touch on out of the game, Tom Rockliffe suspended for uh, for one game. Now, I have seen the incident a few times now. It's a bit obscure, the vision they have of it. My first thought, and it very much was a Lions fan thought, was that is complete rubbish, that he could be wiped out for that. <laughs> you were more, a more impartial journalism opinion. What, what were your thoughts? Oh, look, I hadn't seen it for quite a while, but I have seen the footage. And, um, I mean, my, my instinct is that it's soft. Like, there's no, I think it's a soft, um, oh, I guess it's a soft suspension. But I look at it and think, Rocky. <laughs> and I, I'm a massive fan of Tom Rockliffe. I think he's a ripping uh he's a great fella and he's a and he's just um essential guy for the brisbane lions but he's just putting himself in these positions <laughs> he's it happened in round one against sam mitchell probably very similar to this one it doesn't look like much it's a hit to the stomach is what it looks like uh alex rance has gone down same as sam mitchell went down i mean if you're not expecting a hit to the stomach it's going to floor you so i guess he's just got to probably not put himself in these positions he's can consider himself very unlucky, I think, on both occasions. But there's only so many times you can call yourself unlucky. You've just got to stop doing it. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with you on that front. I mean, uh, I did wonder, though, was it partially, you know, in, like looked at more closely because it's Tom Rockliffe because he's a player who does have a bit of a record for these maybe. kinds of things. If it was an ablet, would he have maybe gotten off? You just don't know. That is, I'm not going to launch conspiracy mm. theories here. <laughs> but, I mean, look, to, I am a bit impartial. We both did sit here at the, after round one and say, Rocky did deserve to go mm. for that that hit back then against Hawthorne. I just thought on this one that there was probably, I, I don't think there was enough contact, you know, as the, the cop out to get away from a suspension is, enough contact to constitute a report. But, you know, it's been done. The, the club's accepted it. We will be without Rocky this weekend, which makes the West Coast Eagles a very daunting challenge considering there is no Rockliffe, no Rich, no Redden. It's, uh, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> 
Yeah, it definitely is. Just on Rocky, I'm sure it's something you'd probably like to challenge, but they're very hard to beat yeah. in that instance. I'm sure he's itching to have a challenge, <laughs> but it's just too risky. And you're exactly right this weekend. Huge challenge for the Lions with the three R's. First time since they've been drafted that, that not one of them will be in the team. Of course, Jack Redden's amazing streak's been broken with uh, a stress fracture that we learned about last week. And now no Tommy Rockliffe for a week. So uh, that word opportunity comes up again, but um, it's going to be a very young and very inexperienced, generally speaking, uh, team on Saturday night, save for a few guys in the back line who have got plenty of experience. But difficult challenge, but I really reckon the Lions have got a chance this week. And the West Coast don't... Uh, they don't impress me that much, to be honest. Like they, they are very up and down team. They were quite good against Sydney on the weekend, but I reckon Brisbane might find themselves a sneaky chance this week. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I do feel a bit bad because we are running out of time. But that we didn't touch on a few of the other positives out of the game. Just quickly, uh, Darcy Gardner I thought was very good. brilliant. Yeah. Justin Clark, we chatted with him last week. He was outstanding on Jack Rewalt. We kept him in form, which was good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel McStay in his second game showed quite a bit. Um, you know, Clay common Beams theme there, good. isn't there? Young key, young key defenders. Yeah, very good. All three of them were, you know, gave a, a massive, a uh, lot of optimism about our, our defensive stocks going forward. So those were absolute positives. A few others to take out of the game as well. But when we do look forward to West Coast, as much as I do think this is an opportunity, this is one that I probably penciled in a few weeks ago. Is we're a genuine chance here. So you know, without Rockcliffe and Red in it, becomes um, it becomes a much tougher challenge. Yeah, you're spot on. Huge hole. I mean, that's two of your four or five best players off the top of my head. Uh, now you're replacing them with probably, you know, guys between 18 and ranked 18 and 25 on your list. So it's a big change and puts a big dent in the chances, but I, I still think they're in with a fighting chance this weekend. We will get to our tips at the end of the show. After this, though, we're chatting to development coach Mitch Hahn on the FanCast. The best way to keep track of everything Lions is to head to lions.com.au. It's the first place to find the latest Lions news and videos. Get the lowdown on upcoming games, results and player stats. There's also great ways to interact with live chats, downloads and Player of the Year voting updates. And with the social media hub, you can connect with all the Lions social media activity. Lions.com.au. Everything Lions, all in one place. We're joined today on the FanCast by one of the development coaches, Mitch Hunt. Thanks very much for joining us today, Mitch. No worries, cheers. Uh, so we'll, we'll kick off with a, a general question. Obviously, you do a lot of work developing the, the young players on the list. How have you seen that throughout 2014? I mean, many people would say that the young kids have been the, the major, uh, I'd say, highlight of the season. Is, have you guys been really, really pleased with the development of the list in general? Oh, yeah, look, we have. I mean, um, the thing with development, it takes time. And the thing with football is sometimes people think that one week is time. So, um, I mean... <laughs> Over the course of the year so far, you know, we've had some really good performances and really good improvements from our kids. But they're, look, they're going to need, especially, you know, the first draft seasons have come in this year, the first year, they're going to need a good 12 months um, behind them before we start to see some real improvements, even though we've seen some really, you know, solid improvements from, you know, Lewis Taylor, James Aish, uh, Darcy Gardner, those guys that have already played senior football, Tom Cutler, Dan McStay. So, um, the pleasing thing is that these guys are getting some games early and they've, they've shown some real improvement. We hear the word development, development coaches. Uh, Mitch, can you tell us a, a little bit more nuts and bolts? What have you done this year and what does your role entail? Yeah, look, I, look, I work closely with Murray Davis, who's the senior backline line coach. So each of the development coaches are aligned with one of the senior line coaches. So Lee Harding is the forward line coach who's aligned with Simon Black and then Matty Francis does the midfield stuff with Shane Wo and then Gary O'Donnell, who's the head of development, oversees the program and, and sort of coaches the uh, reserve team. Our role sort of entails, um, for me, on game day, is working closely with the backs, which, um, you know, we have generally four or five guys, depending on how healthy our list is, going through that area. So, you know, breaking down their tapes, um, educating them on how they can get better and, and break their way into the senior team, and then obviously working closely with Murray Davis as to what areas we need to improve as a whole group and work on, because there's, there's young kids that need developing that are playing senior football, so we work hand in hand. As a development coach who does work with the back line, then you must have been pretty stoked with the performance of a few of your young kids on uh, on Saturday afternoon. Uh, Justin Clark, Darcy Gardner, Dan McStay all had a very impressive games. Did you see it that way too? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and there's going to be fluctuations within the period, especially when you're giving, when we've got that many. I mean, half your back line there is um, 
you know, very, I suppose, inexperienced. I mean, just Justin Clark has improved this year from his uh, season last year. Um, and obviously Darcy and Dan, you know, in their first year of footy, um, I think the pleasing thing, that, you know, the guys that we've got around them and, and Joel Patful and Jed Adcock have been setting really good examples for them um, and helping educate them on field, which is certainly really important within the development. One guy that intrigues me this year, Mitch, is Darcy Gardner. He's a guy we actually hope to get on the show before the end of the season, but he's had a um, terrific first season, I think. He seems like such an angry bloke on the field, but, <laughs> but we see him as a sort of quietly spoken guy off it. Can you tell us a bit about Darcy and your impressions of him this year? Yeah, uh, you're spot on with sort of what you just said there. He's, he's got a brilliant attitude and a real hunger for the contest. You know, he's hard-nosed and very determined and hates getting beaten, you know, even on the, on the table tennis in the player's room, he doesn't like getting beaten in anything that he does, so he's, he's broken a few bats on the ping pong table and shown the boys that he, you know, he's a real competitive beast um, and I think that's what's held him in really good stead, like his body's still, the, you know, got some growing to do as well, he's got to grow into that a little bit, but his, I suppose, attitude and determination has really shown him um, or led the way for us this year, especially for him as an individual and it's you know it's shown that he's going to have a long career he seems to get on the nerves of his opposition quite a few times throughout the year we've seen him uh, earn quite a few free kicks because he's uh, made his his opponent maybe lash out a bit get a bit frustrated do you know what his secrets are that that makes his opponents so annoyed at him oh look, i think it's just good defending and you look at any of the good defenders or the elite defenders in the competition you know the, the harry taylors and the teddy richards the, uh, and, you know, you go back to Simon Prestigiacomo, those types of guys who never give their forward, uh, you know, a centimetre of space. They're always just touching them, niggling them, uh, you know, letting them know that they're right there. Um, and then when their turn is to actually put some real body contact on or, or have an aggressive spoil to be able to do that, um, understand that there's going to be times when they're going to get beaten, but it's being able to have that attitude and mindset to, of never giving up. And that's what Darcy's got. You know, he, he may get beaten in contests, but it's not going to change the way that he attacks the next contest or the next contest. And that's why, you know, he's had such a, a good start to his career. We're always talking about uh, Lions fans, members, whoever, supporters are always talking about trying to find the next Jonathan Brown, the next key forward. But obviously key defensive posts are just as important, particularly with the, the age of Dan Merritt and Joel Paffel. Do you think the guys there at the moment, the Clarks, Gardeners, McStays, are they legitimately guys that, you know, can play key posts and play three key tools, you know, for a long time to come? Oh, certainly. And then, you know, you've got Tom Cutler, who's played a few games as a, as a running halfback as well, and Ryan Harwood, who's, you know, really progressed from his 16 games last year as the running defender, um, like a Jed Adcock role as well. So I really do think that those guys can hold down a key post. But as I said, when we're talking about development, it's still going to take a little bit of time for those guys to grow into their body. If you look at Justin Clark, Darcy Gardner and Dan McStay, um, you can see that there's still a fair bit of size to put on their body and, and grow in that. But in saying that also, you know, they've been able to have an impact already on the contest. So, you know, that's going to hold them in good stead in the years to come. One of the uh, younger guys who's a bit more mature now and has been a bit of a mainstay in the, the defensive unit for a few years now, but has fallen a bit out of favour and a bit out of form this year is Mitch Golby. Uh, what, what do you think's happened to Mitch this year and what's he doing in terms of your work with him to, uh, to get back to where he was? Yeah, look, Mitch is working really hard, you know, off the field to him to get his game up to standard. And uh, I suppose things that have let him down this year is, you know, his ground level balls and his ability to be able to really defend. We know that he can he can produce that offensive movement, but um, I suppose his ability to be able to really lock down and defend first, um, and really I suppose value that defensive part of the game before you start worrying about the offense is probably the one area where Mitch can improve. But look, he's certainly putting the time in off the field to to get better and. You know, he's, you know, he really helps. He's got a great knowledge of the game plan and, you know, he's really helping the younger kids along. He's got a really good attitude and he's going about it the right way. So it's, um, I think when you've, you've, it's been shown that when guys continue to put in the time and are working hard on their game, that, you know, it does turn around. So it's, I would think and like to hope that it's only a matter of time before it turns around to goals. And, you know, he's obviously he's got to work on his kicking as well. Um, that's certainly something that uh, he's been putting time into as well. Just another guy, Mitch, that we've seen go through that back line a bit this year that we didn't see do that last year is Sam Mays. Uh, I think uh, Lepper said earlier in the year it's a, a, a bit of a, a twofold thing. One, one a bit of ed, uh, defensive education and also to have someone to run off that back half with his good ball use. We haven't quite seen him flourish there yet, but internally, have you been 
happy with his form or has he still got to keep improving in those aspects? He's got to keep improving. I think it to, it's a progression. And, you know, Sam Mays isn't the only one. There's guys that we're playing in the reserve level that have that are going through that experiment, well, not experiment, that learning opportunity is playing as a defender who are really forwards as well. So, you know, we've got Jackson Payne, who's a, from Collingwood, come up as a forward, and he's actually playing uh, as a backman at the moment. Um, you know, we threw Dan McStay forward about um, six weeks ago for two weeks um, just to give him a bit of education and learning development in that role. But Sam Mays has certainly um, taken it on board, and hopefully, um, you know, when he goes back, into the forward line or onto the wing where we saw him play some really good football last year, he can take the lessons that he's learned as a defender and apply them as a, not only as a forward um, but as a wingman and then um, that will certainly improve him. So talking about Jackson Payne momentarily, we've seen him in the senior side a bit this year up forward. Is his current uh, time down back in the reserves, is that just a learning exercise or is that actually to see if he could potentially fill a, a key position down back? Oh, I think that there's there's an opportunity there for Jackson if he performs. But at the moment, look, we're we're looking at developing him in that position. But as as it is, when you give guys an opportunity, some guys grab it with both hands. Um, you can you can use these experiments on players or learning periods and find out all oh, all of a sudden that hang on, Jackson may be uh, better as a defender than what he is as a forward. Um, but I think we've got to put him back forward to see what he has learned as a defender, and then that will give us an indication as to where he plays going forward. And, and obviously where the senior coach sees him. Well, now that we've nailed you about half the team, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll just have, we'll have a, a quick question about West Coast this weekend. We know Tom Rockliffe's been suspended, Jack Redden's um, out, so there's a couple of big holes in the midfield. We know Redo didn't play last week, but that's a big chunk out of your midfield. How do you overcome that and try and beat West Coast on Saturday night? Oh, well, it's another learning opportunity for another player. And a, a, and sometimes all you need in football is an opportunity. So, you know, whether it's a Nick Robinson or a uh, Zach O'Brien that gets the opportunity for them to come in and be able to do what they've been able to do at uh, NEFL level is going to be really important. There's no secret that um, every game is a tough game. So we're going to have to be switched on. And obviously one of our real strengths are our small guys up forward, you know, the Zorko, Green and Lewis Taylor. So... Our ability to be able to win the ball out of the middle is something that's really important. Um, and you know, thankfully, Steph Martin's come in and done a really good job over the last month. Um, so we need him to continue that form going forward um, and being able to use the ball when we get, I suppose, in that forward 50 arc, which we had a lot of opportunities on the weekend, but we just didn't uh, find the targets inside. So, you know, we've got to, we've got to get those guys some uncontested marks, those small guys, get them marking the ball, not only crumbing it. Um, and then making sure that we finish off our opportunities when we do go forward. Just one more then before we do let you go. Uh, obviously, a bunch of Lions fans are uh, from last year have a few scars. are a bit jittery about the young players after we lost quite a few at the end of last year. I know you're much more involved in their on-field than, than off-field, but is your general feel that all the, the young guys from last year's draft have settled in pretty well? Yeah, and that's something that Brisbane identified early last year, and that's you know why... Um, our development department has been beefed up from last year. I mean, there was only Gary O'Donnell and Lee Harding who were in the position this year. Um, I've come into the role and so has Matty Francis. So um, now the contact that the players are getting in terms of their education and learning and developing, if they're not playing senior football, uh, they're certainly still getting noticed and still getting recognition for the work that they're doing at the lower grade. It's something that we've put a lot of focus on um, putting time into these players off field um, and you know we, we've been able to work closely with the players and feel that they're in a, a really solid and strong position and the kids that have been drafted at the moment they're you know they're happy and they're obviously playing senior football which helps so they're learning so it's important that we as coaches and as a club continue to support these guys going forward um, and be honest and open with our communication. Well, thanks very much for joining us on the FanCast today. All the best with the rest of the season and the off-season ahead. No worries. Cheers, guys. This weekend sees another doubleheader at the Gabba with the, the Lions' Neefal team in a curtain raiser taking on the Northern Territory Thunder. That's at 3.30pm. And then the Lions' seniors take on the uh, West Coast at 7.40, also at the Gabba. Two good games. Get along to see the reserves. They didn't have a great game against GWS, but uh, they will bounce back on quite sure against the Northern Territory. As for the seniors, Mike, we've spoken already in this show about the injury toll, the, mm. the fact that the midfield's going to be pretty depleted. It's going to be a challenge, but you still give us a chance. 
Yeah, I do. I'm really looking forward to seeing Nick Natanui play, who's supposed to be back this week. And they'll have a West Coast, no matter which way they go, they've rotated a bit in the last few weeks. They'll have a dual ruck combination. Natanui will be back, whether he's with Cox or Lysette, I guess we'll find out. That's going to be crucial, as it always is, for Stefan Martin, who's had an amazing uh, return to the team in the last five weeks. Can't wait to watch that match up. And also the midfield you've touched on. No Redden, no Rockliffe. You'd think uh, Zach O'Brien might come in, uh, might come back in. Um, the likes of Ryan Lester, Clay Beams, they've got big tasks in front of them, uh, trying to curtail guys like Shuey, Gaff, etc., etc. So the midfield battle, we always talk about it. Probably where it'll be won this week. Um, I think Brisbane, if they can get enough ball in the middle, they can generate enough speed with our Mosquito fleet and that outside run to generate enough score. I, I actually, I'm tipping a little bit of an upset this week. I think Brisbane can get over the line. I don't really? know, I've just got a bit of a feeling this week. How yeah. many points? Oh, close. It'll be close. Um, okay. Within two goals. All right. This uh, is... I don't know. It's a bit of a hunch, actually, yeah. which you know I'm not prone to go no, out no. <laughs> Well, this is a fan cast first. You tipping them while I'm tipping the opposition. <laughs> I think it is. This, is, is, this is a first. first. This is normally the other way around. Jeez, now I'm nervous. If we, get, <laughs> if we lose by 10 goals, I'll be the worst bloke in the world. <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I was thinking we would win this game until the Rockliffe news came through. I think he's that instrumental for us that it will be probably too much of a challenge. But you're completely right. If Beams and Leicester, uh, you know, and also probably Mays maybe having a run through the middle and Aish uh, through the middle, if they can step up if they can really play outstanding games we are every chance i do expect west coast to get over the top of us by around about three four goals in the end but i would love to be proven wrong and um i'd love you the to be shoe, right the shoe is on the other foot this <laughs> yeah. time that's normally my line you make a good point about sam mays it'd be nice to see him get a bit more run through the midfield he's struggled a bit for different reasons uh in the last sort of two months so it'd be very nice to see him get a bit more of a chance and show us what he can do absolutely we'll be back next week to review that game until then this is the fancast bye